Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Raw Law Unfiltered with your host, the DUI Guy Plus. That is me. Um, today, we are going to be covering something that is heavy and hard. Um, we're going to be going over Katie Meyer's complaint. Um, now, before we dive into it, I just want to give you all a couple of pieces of news. So first of all, I am wearing a um, Hendrix shirt today because he deserves all the honors and all the credit and all the great, great music that he has made over the years. And I figured it would be so much fitting to have my Hendrix shirt for this, number one. Uh, number two, I just learned that Tug is not on, so we have all of Tug's crew up in this bitch, and that is awesome. So welcome, everyone. And um, finally, I just did a live, not a live, sorry, a recording with Danny Ann. She is the, the prosecutor, the DA for DA, if you all remember, she was running. Super, super cool gal. Um, if you haven't checked out her channel yet, by all means, go. She's so close to 3,000 subscribers. If every single one of you who's with me right now goes and subscribes, she's going to be at 3,000. Excuse me. If, you have, if you're not already subscribed to her, um, if we can have the mods shout out her channel. Uh, she's super cool, down to earth, smart, funny. Um, very, very intelligent, extremely intelligent, and a brilliant lawyer. So uh, her, there it is. Thank you, Rose. Her, she interviewed me. And it, it, it's kind of like a, we go through the history or whatever of my firm, her past and all that. So it was kind of interesting. You're going to get to learn a little bit about my myself and her uh, when she edits it and publishes it. We were supposed to do it yesterday, but we never got a chance. Um, so whenever she's done, she's going to post it. And then uh, she offered for me to put it on my channel as well. So I'm more than happy to do that once she rakes up her views. Because uh, I'm, I'm happy to give her first dibs. She obviously w has much better use for that kind of fresh content than, than my channel. So I'm giving her the honors, of course. And it's her interview. It was her offer in the first place. Um, the next few days, I will not be streaming. I'll be taking some personal time, um, nothing to do with my, my surgery, by the way, that went great. Uh, I know a lot of people in the chat were a little suspicious, you know, um, <laughs> when I was like, I am, I'm on ibuprofen and Tylenol, you know, when you don't do that stuff, even ibuprofen can mess you up a little bit. Uh, especially at very, very high doses if you never take it. Like I never I never take stuff. It's just not what I do. Uh, and plus the, you know, when they sedated me, I, I thought it was just going to be like some gas, you know, put a little mask of no, they put an IV. I don't even know what they put in my bloodstream yesterday. So I know that I was definitely a little bit loopy, but it was worth it. It was worth it. Uh, I, I'm glad that I was not conscious during the procedure uh don't forget to like this video comment below subscribe to the channel <sighs> join on as a member we have a bunch of new emojis um thank you amy goodhart amy goodhart has been so instrumental to this channel like very unexpectedly so uh, she, I think, how many emojis does she have claimed a right to at this point? Um, like three, four? Let's see. She's got the Elon. She's got rights to the Ben Chu, the Evil Larry, and, of course, the Amy Goodhart. Yeah, four. Look at that. That is awesome.
and she's she's really cool. I'm um so I'm gonna be in Los Angeles Christmas Day through January 6th. And I'm gonna see her. I already told her that I'm coming and we're gonna hang out. Um I mean I have plans to see some other people, so be on the lookout for some of those news potentially. Uh, and then I'm gonna be in Las Vegas, January 6th through the 8th. And then I'm coming back home. So two weeks I'm gonna be gone. Uh, Zinnia, don't cry. <laughs> Baby, don't cry. All along the watchtower, Zinnia was walking around and crying. See how what I did there? Yeah, Jimi Hendrix meets Wazoom, bada bing, bada boom. That I got nothing. Um, so I am very excited. It's going to be a good time. And uh, thank you for the gifted memberships. Who who did this? Oh, Viking, Viking gifted ten memberships to the DUI guy plus. Thank you very much. Very very much appreciated. Um. Viking, did you get my email, by the way? I don't know if you responded to it. So we're, oh, let me let me tell you guys. So there will be no, no stream Friday, Saturday, Sunday, okay? There'll be no stream Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then I will be streaming on Monday. I will be streaming on Monday. One of these days is going to be Curious George Goes to the Hospital, and then a few other stuff. We may have to catch up on some stuff because I, I don't know what's going to happen over the next three days. Um, and then maybe some more boozy. Oh, did you guys see that? Nate the Lawyer made national headlines today with uh, on the Daily Mail with uh, the boozy stuff. People are finally calling boozy the slut that he is. Uh, I mean, Jesus Christ, this guy... He's been, he's like, oh my God, leave these people alone. How much more can you like hate on them? And meanwhile, he's shitting on everybody behind everybody's back. Like he's such a fucking two-faced slut. I swear to God, I hate him so much. But I'm not, I, I doubt I'm going to be making any more videos like just on him because he's not worth it. He's not worth my breath. So let him, uh... and we are going to be doing a Christmas special. We are going to be doing a Christmas special. I have an outfit for our Christmas special that I'm going to be doing. Uh, that is on December 25th. And then on December 26th, so on the 25th, it will be the last book, right? So we're reading them a bit out of order. We have two Curious George books left. Did you all hear that? She is going berserk. She's like, I don't want Curious George to end. Or maybe she's terrified that I'm leaving her for two weeks. Um, so I have, uh, so we're going to be doing Curious George on Christmas. And I'm going to be in LA when I do that. Uh, or I might do it like Christmas Eve. I might do it like on the 24th. Yeah, I'm going to do it on the 24th, Christmas Eve. Because 25th, I'm going to be traveling. Unless I do it like 25th at night. Which is possible because I'm going to gain three hours to the day as I fly to Los Angeles. So we might do that. I don't know. Be on the lookout. 24th, 25th, we'll do the Christmas special. And then the 26th, we're going to read Green Eggs and Ham. That's going to be our next book. And then on the 27th, we're hopefully, if everything goes right, I already have at least one or two volunteers. This is what I started asking uh, Viking about because she volunteered. And I'm holding your feet to the fire. Hey, 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 you give me your email. You volunteer. I'm going to absolutely um, uh, bug you with this stuff. So uh, I sent out an email to all of our volunteers. Um, I'm going to be the judge more than likely the first time around. And then we can switch off. I don't mind giving the judge position to somebody else. And then I can be like the prosecutor or the criminal defense attorney or whatever. Or a witness. Uh, I, I think I can, I can literally play all witnesses. So <clears throat> it's going to be fun. We're going to be doing mock trials of these uh, fairy tales. And you, the audience, is going to have the opportunity to be the jury in all of our cases. So it's going to be a lot of fun. 
Um, so our first one is going to be green eggs and ham. And more than likely, more than likely, it's going to be um, Sam I Am suing, or the main character will be suing, excuse me, Sam I Am for harassment. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Very, very interesting. So, oh, I just got another email. Who is it? Um, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Viking. Oh, yeah, that was you. Got it. Okay. So, um, there we go. We already have at least three. I just need one more. Uh, it's no rush. We got time. We're just, we're literally going to ad lib it for the most part. We're going to ad lib it. We're, it's not going to be a lot of work. It's just going to be relaxed, fun. I know Nick, Nick has kind of made it seem like a whole project that you need to like undertake and no, it's, it's going to be nothing like that. We're going to try and keep it simple, keep it silly, keep it stupid, keep it fresh, keep it fun. Keep it simple, stupid, fresh, and fun. So you have that to look forward to. And then next week, uh, we'll figure whatever news comes. That's what we're going to do, as we always do. Uh, and then finally... While I'm traveling, I uh, hopefully I'm going to be visiting some cool locations. I'm going to be doing maybe some lives on location. Probably not, but you never know where you one might end up in Los Angeles or Las Vegas. So we'll see. We will see. Uh, oh, and then I just got another email. Look at that. You start talking about it, all of a sudden, boom. People come out of the woodwork. I love it. Okay. You guys ready? Katie Myers complaint. Obviously not her personally, of course, because she unfortunately is no longer with us. She's deceased. <sighs> um, she took her own life. She took her own life because Stanford stabbed her in the fucking back. Because Stanford has no soul and looks at their students, much like many top tier Ivy League universities, sees students as cannon fodder to achieve their own purposes and do not care about what they do to students. They try to maintain like this aura of we care about you by including what links and phone numbers to like, if you are contemplating hurting yourself, please dial this. But it's all formality bullshit. They don't really have like a system in place to help these people. They simply are like, yeah, 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 here you go. Fuck you. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Um, when I was a student and I didn't go to a, a high tier university. I don't give a shit. I always knew the game is rigged. You just need a degree from something other than an online university and you'd be okay for the most part. And University of Louisville is actually not that bad. Like it's ranked pretty high up there, including their law school. Um, so I'm happy. You know, it's not about like, unless you're trying to work for a very, very prestigious law firm and you have to like come be in the top five, 10% of your class or 1% of your class, you know, at the end of the day, none of this shit fucking matters. None of it matters. If you're talented, you will grow into your own. 
there's nothing that can stop you. And if you're not, well, then there's nothing they will stop you from failing. So there is absolutely no, um, no ands, ifs, or buts about it. So go out there, do your thing, fuck everybody else. If you're a C student in school, you know what? You might be an A++ or an S tier, as we like to call it in the gaming world, an S tier individual in life. So hopefully you get some uplifting words. These, these words do not fall on deaf ears. Um, don't, don't be, don't, don't feel defeated. You, you know what they say? There's actually even a saying in law school, uh, a students become judges, B students become, or sorry, sorry, flip that a students become professors, B students become judges and C students go on to become millionaire lawyers. Obviously, it's not universally true, but it's just the point of it is it doesn't matter if you're a C student. You're probably just not cut out to be a judge or teaching the law, but you can still succeed in life. So don't don't um, don't don't let uh, life, especially university, fucking university, get you down, please, especially if you're still a student fucking go get it. Go get her, tiger. All right. So these are the law firms that are representing Katie Meyer in her estate. The Justice Law Collaborative from uh, Massachusetts, as you can see, they're pro vicing in. A uh, Wilford Law Firm from Ventura, California. So they're licensed in California. Consumer Protection Legal, which is kind of interesting. I'd like to know a little bit more about their role. They're from Missouri, also pro-hack, of course. And the Law Office of Francis Casey Flynn, Jr. He's another local boy, probably a, a known attorney in the area. And, and they partnered up, the four of them partnered up, and they're representing, as you can see, attorneys for the plaintiffs. Attorneys for the plaintiffs because they represent the plaintiffs, which is more than one. Who are they? In the Superior Court of California, Santa Clara, that's where the university is located. Stephen Meyer and Gina Meyer individually and as successors in interest to Catherine Diane Meyer, also known as... Katie Meyer. They're suing Leland Stanford Junior University, the board of trustees of the university, uh, and all of these other people. Mark uh, Tessier Le Levine, Susie Brubaker Cole, Deborah Zumwalt, Lisa Caldera, Tiffany Gabrielson. Elise Haley, and of course, the Jane Doe's and the John Doe's 1 through 25. The, these are placeholders for any and all additional up to 50 people that they are going to later add to the complaint as their names become more public, more known, and more um, discovered through discovery. As we all know, Michelle Dauber is at the top of the list of these Jane Doe's. So her name will probably be popping up here relatively soon. Um, what are they asking for? They're suing for eight things. Wrongful death. The fact that Katie's death could have been prevented and the university did nothing to prevent that from happening. That is the wrongful death violation. The survival action. The survival action is essentially the parents who survive their child stating that we have a cause of action because of a loss of consortium, which is the loss of love that we could have gotten from our daughter for so many years. The loss of, um, like her presence in our lives, like we survived her. This is what that survival action is about. Breach of implied contract. 
Uh, I imagine that is the basically the the implied contract that the uh, Stanford University has in protecting the welfare of its students by not terrorizing them and causing them distress and thereby putting them in a position where they feel helpless and that they're cornered and they have no choice but to take their own lives. Breach of contract itself, which implied and non-implied. Number five, violation of some educational code. I have no idea what that is. We will get to it. Uh, and there it is. Number six, loss of consortium that we could have had our daughter and we're going to not have her love, her happiness with us, her presence and all that. Negligent infliction of emotional distress for the plaintiffs. And then, of course, intentional infliction of emotional distress for the decedent, which is Katie. So negligently causing emotional distress by having Katie unlive herself on her parents and intentionally doing so to their daughter. Those are those two causes of action. Uh, Viking says, did you get a new profile photo, Viking? I don't recognize this. This is looks new. Uh, I am 52. Good for you. You don't look a day over 30. And finally, finishing my, I know it's filters. I'm just trying to be nice. Um, and finally, finishing my master's after raising my kids and following my hubby's 23 years passing. Wow. Chase the dream and live life. It is too short not to trust me on this one. I believe you. I believe you. Um, and they're demanding a jury trial, of course. Comes now Stephen Meyer, Gina Meyer individually and as successors and in interest. By the way, we will not be covering the whole thing. It is very lengthy. We're going to be skipping around. So uh, don't, don't fret. I'm just covering the most important bits. So you guys get the, the whole story as much as possible. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here for another six hours. Like, no joke. It's a very lengthy complaint. And rightfully so. Comes now Stephen Meyer and Gina Meyer individually and as successors in interest of Catherine Diane Meyer, a.k.a. Katie Meyer, collectively known as plaintiffs, blah, 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 suing Stanford University, blah, 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 and all the people we just mentioned, alleging based on the information in, in the complaint as follows. Plaintiffs bring this action for the personal injuries and emotional distress Katie Myers sustained before her death and for the wrongful death of Katie Meyer. At the time of her death, Katie was a captain of Stanford women's soccer team, a resident advisor in a Stanford freshman dorm, a Mayfield fellow, a defense innovative scholar, a high academic achiever with a 3.84 GPA, an ambassador for just women's sports, the creator of the podcast Be The Mentality, produced by a subsidiary of Facebook, an upcoming speaker of a TEDx talk, a leader and influencer on social media, a candidate for Stanford Law School, a candidate for U.S. women's soccer, and above all, a loving and loyal daughter, sister, friend, teammate, and student. Jesus Christ, what a way to start a complaint. This girl had everything going for her. She was the creme de la creme of the de la cremes in a top two school or top three school, depending on who you talk to, in the nation. In the fucking country. And this is how they treated her. Like cannon fodder. The actions that led to the death of Katie Meyer began and ended with Stanford University. On the night of her death on February 28, 2022, Stanford University's Office of Community Standards negligently and recklessly issued Katie formal written notice that you are charged with a violation of the fundamental standard by spilling coffee on another student through a letter received after hours. The formal disciplinary charge stemmed from an occurrence on August 28, 2021. I wonder why what took him six months. 
where Katie was riding her bike and was alleged to have spilled coffee on a football player who allegedly sexually assaulted a minor female soccer player on the team in which Katie served as a captain. The football player did not bring the OCS complaint. Defendant Lisa Caldera, Dean of Residential Education, did. And instead, the football player indicated throughout the disciplinary process that he would like to make amends and did not want any punishment that impacts her life. The formal disciplinary charge letter that Katie received on the evening of her death was five pages, single-spaced, and contained threatening language regarding sanctions and potential removal from the university, and was sent by Assistant Dean Tiffany Gabrielson. The formal disciplinary charge letter related to spilled coffee also informed Katie her diploma was being placed on hold only three months shy of her graduation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine you're about to graduate in three months and the university is telling you, oh, yeah, uh, you you won't be. Like, dude, I would lose my shit. I would lose my shit. Um. Threatening her status as a Stanford student further, captain and member of a soccer team, residential advisor, the Mayfield Fellow, Defense Innovative, all her stuff, and her ability to attend law school, amongst other things. The cover email and formal disciplinary charge letter related to spilled coffee both contain language assuming guilt and stated that the judicial officer shall determine that there is sufficient evidence to file formal charges when he or she concludes that a fair-minded panelist could find the allegations to be true beyond a reasonable doubt. Whatever the fuck that means. Because what are they going to do? They're going to put it in front of a grand jury like a mini Stanford grand jury that they're going to create out of whom is it going to be unbiased? Are they paid? Are, like, I don't understand a judicial officer. I don't know what that means. That language is all bogus. It's fancy language. That means absolutely nothing. They're hiding behind a veil. The OCS charge letter was recklessly and negligently sent by Stanford employees after hours on the last day in which Stanford could charge Katie six months to the day. There you go. That's why they waited. They're like, it's now or never, fuckers. As in accordance with Stanford's policies, a charge must be brought within six months of the occurrence and the spilled coffee occurred on August 28th. There it is. Katie received the formal charge letter on the evening of February 28th after 7 p.m. when the OCS office was closed. So she can't even reach out and call them and be like, hey, can I talk to someone? Stanford's Counseling and Psychiatric Services, CAPS, was also closed. Literally, they created the perfect storm. They created the perfect storm. Katie, sitting alone in her dorm room when it was dark outside, immediately responded to the email expressing how shocked and distraught she was over being charged and threatened with removal from the university. Stanford failed to respond to Katie's expression of distress, instead ignored it, and scheduled a meeting for three days later via email. Stanford employees made no effort whatsoever to check on Katie's well-being, either by a simple phone call or in-person welfare check. Stanford employees failed to support Katie when she expressed feelings of despair, despite having been previously unnoticed after having been told by Katie in November 2021 that she was terrified, an accident will destroy my future. And she had been scared for months that my clumsiness will ruin my chances of leaving Stanford on a good note and experiencing much anxiety related to the OCS process. This was the final contact Katie had with the OCS office until February of 2022. According to the reports of several friends, Katie had thought the complaint regarding spilled coffee was over and not being pursued since she had not been contacted by OCS since November of 2021. From the onset, there was no reasonable basis nor sufficient evidence for Stanford to bring such harsh and aggressive disciplinary charges for purported purported spilled coffee and the threats levied against Katie by Stanford employees were, excuse me, unwarranted, overly punitive without due care and recklessness. In short, Stanford employees used the OCS process selectively on Katie Meyer as a form of institutional bullying. 
Stanford was well aware prior to Katie's disciplinary action that its OCS process was overly punitive, not educational, and causing harm to its students. Hi, baby. As reported by its own students and faculty assigned to bring it bring its policies up to date through Committee 10 in April of 2021. Yet Stanford failed to make any changes to its clearly harmful and dangerous processes. Prior to receiving the late evening email with the formal charge letter, Katie had no prior history of mental illness and excitedly planning her future on February 28, 2022. During the earlier hours of the day on February 28, 2022, prior to receiving the OCS letter, excuse me, the OCS charge letter, welcome Rebel Bird, um, prior to receiving the OCS charge letter, Katie was planning spring break, booking airfare, planning a birthday party for the next night, designing a class she intended to teach, attending her own classes and soccer practice, meeting with friends on FaceTime with her mom and sisters. Everyone she interacted with has advised she was well, in good spirits, and the usual Katie. See, what they're doing is they're building a record. They're trying to show that... Because Stanford's easiest argument is that the letter from Stanford had nothing to do with Katie's choice to unlive herself. She would have done it anyway. Uh, Stanford just, it, it coincided with Stanford's letter. We didn't do anything. What they're doing is they're showing that no, prior, the day of, earlier that day, she was a completely different person. She was happy. She was cheerful. She was planning stuff. And it was your letter. It was your doing that fucked it all up. And here's why. That's how you build a record. Stanford's after-hour disciplinary charge and the reckless nature and manner of submission to Katie caused Katie to suffer an acute stress reaction that impulsively led to her unliving herself. Katie's unliving herself was completed without planning and solely, you're the only ones that caused this, Stanford, is what they're saying in response to the shocking and deeply distressing information she received from Stanford while alone in her room without any support or access to resources. Stanford selectively chose not to bring any disciplinary charges against the football player who allegedly sexually assaulted Katie's minor teammate. David Shaw and Stanford University were required to dismiss the football player from the team under its own policies known as Set the Expectation Pledge that claims to have zero tolerance for sexual violence, yet failed to initiate any meaningful Title IX or OCS disciplinary process for the football player. Furthermore, Defendant President Mark Tessier Levine, deans and associate deans Lisa Caldera and Tiffany Gabrielson and uh, Alice Haley, Vice Provost Susie Brubaker Cole and General Counsel Deborah Zumwalt, collectively individual defendants, were on notice that the OCS process was punitive and inflicting inappropriate, unnecessary distress on its students including Katie herself. Now, despite this knowledge that the OCS process was overly punitive and inflicted emotional distress on its students, including Katie, all of these people did nothing to rectify it, breaching the standard of care and owed uh, duty that they owed to Katie and other students. On the facts alleged herein regarding Stanford's OCS process, Stanford and all individual defendants breached the standard of care, substantially contributing to her untimely and tragic death. Had Stanford and its employees acted with reasonable care and with any sense of humanity, listen to that language, any sense of humanity, 
Katie would be alive and here with us today. Like that is just the most depressing fucking thing ever. If only they at least acted like humans with some humanity, humility, empathy, nothing. Cannon fodder. Defendants are liable to the plaintiffs under the following counts. We already went over those. Defendants' actions and failure to act resulting in the death of Katie Meyer are particularly egregious in light of the years of direct knowledge. So these fuckers knew this is what they're saying. Possessed by the defendants. University knew that, number one, the university was unnoticed. They knew this. Their disciplinary process of students was too punitive and often violated constitutional rights of students like it did here. Number two, the university had a long history of extensive people unliving themselves and attempts to do so by its students. Number three, the university provides inadequate mental health assistance for its students, in particular, excuse me, its student athletes. Number four, many of its students and student athletes, including Katie, are perfectionists. Number five, it's discriminatorily dis uh, treated Katie Meyer differently and far more punitively than it treated others for spilling coffee, including the football player accused of sexual assault, despite the same types of evidence for each incident. Number six and number six, Katie Meyer was traumatized by the OCS process, which caused or substantially contributed to cause Katie to suffer an acute stress reaction and the uncontrollable impulse to end her life, resulting in her tragic and untimely death. In particular, uh, all, everything they did caused it. Um, the distress was definitely foreseeable. It was almost inevitable that this would happen. And the defendants cannot escape the consequences of their actions. They must be held accountable, not only to satisfy the demands of justice, but just as importantly to discourage such flagrantly irresponsible actions or inactions in the actions and or inactions of others who defendants control from being perpetuated on vulnerable students like Katie and others in the future. So that was the introduction. Uh, jurisdiction and venue, I mean, obviously, uh, the lawyers have to lay out that California is the proper venue and the jurisdiction is proper, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then they're going to name all the defendants, uh, or sorry, all the uh, plaintiffs, the decedent, of course. Uh, Catherine uh, D. Meyer died on the evening of February 28th or early morning of March 1st, like literally the same night, basically. She was 22. Jesus. Now, they name all the defendants, who they are. Uh, Stanford University Board of, Trust <coughs> Board of Trustees, excuse me, um, where the university is located, the president, all the defendants that they name, the vice provost, committee, da, da, da. So these are all the people that they're suing. Defendants such and such, Alice Haley. Um, these people are all on notice. And of course, whenever this complaint references is made to defendants, such allegations shall refer to the acts and omissions of those one through 25. Those are the unnamed defendants, which will we will learn who they are in due course. Now, the factual allegations. Katie was a loyal and loving daughter, sister, and friend, and an iconic athlete, student, and leader at Stanford University. Katie was born on January 20th, 2000. She's a 2000 baby. Look at that. In Burbank, California, to Stephen and Gina Meyer. She was raised with and leaves behind two loving sisters. Katie eagerly tried various sports and activities and was always an adventuresome child who radiated a boundless happy energy. She had a vibrant love for school from an early age and was always open to new friendships with anyone. Happy to spend time playing and running outside or creating art 
and painting on rainy days. Katie has played soccer since she was five years old. She played many positions and eventually tried her hand at goalkeeping and quickly displayed a natural talent and fearlessness for that position. She worked very hard on her craft and soon ascended into the National Travel Club Soccer World, the ECNL, as her competitive spirit and passion fueled her and her teammates. Through high school in Newbury Park, California, Katie stayed involved in various activities at her school, including being a kicker on the football team, including being a kicker on the football team. She took up surfing the waters off the shores of Ventura County and loved it. She traveled frequently, uh, attending numerous U.S. Youth National Team soccer training camps around the country and a few tournaments abroad, grateful to be representing her country. Indeed, Katie was getting recognition nationally for her soccer play. If you don't know about it, look it up. It's out there. I've looked it up. It's real. In addition to her school team, she played for club teams, Real SoCal and Eagles Soccer Club, as well as the U16 Girls National Team. Because of her academic and athletic skills and well-rounded character, Katie was recruited by many colleges, including Stanford University, which began recruiting her after her freshman year of high school. Like, they did not wait. Katie committed to Stanford in the fall of her sophomore year of high school in 2015. She was extremely proud to be part of the Stanford family, and for good reason. She had worked relentlessly throughout her younger life to be qualified to become a part of it. Katie was excited and determined to play soccer for Stanford as a freshman, but was redshirted as they had a senior goalkeeper. Katie was told the team wanted to preserve her four years of NCAA eligibility. Because of her competitive nature, Katie was initially devastated by this decision, but she persevered by focusing on her studies and infusing the team with relentless supportive energy during trainings and along the sidelines uh, in their games. By her sophomore year, redshirt freshman Katie's tireless work brought her into a key role on the soccer team, and her impact played a critical role in the 2019 College Cup Championship game against the University of North Carolina. As a result of her work ethic and drive, Katie's remarkable saves in penalty kicks resulted in her being named the 2019 NCAA Championship Games MVP. Wow. By 2020, teammates voted Katie as captain of Stanford's women's soccer, where she served and thrived in the role. Katie passionately mentored young teammates and inspired them to be their best every day. In addition to serving as captain for Stanford women's soccer, in her life away from Cardinal sport, Katie served the university without compensation as a resident assistant, the RA in Crothers Hall, where approximately 120 freshmen reside beginning in September of 2021. Katie wanted to make a tangible difference at Stanford and beyond. She is quoted in a November 2nd, 2021 article from Go Stanford's as saying, there will be a day when all Stanford athletes hang up their cleats and ask, ask themselves, what is next? I want to make the world a better place where we need few, uh, a few more optimists who believe they can be that change. What a positive character, huh? What a positive person she was. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable that they always take the good ones, man. They always fucking take the good ones. And then evil bastards like Boozy are still around and cause ruckus and shit. I'm not saying that he should unlive himself. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, why her? That's what I'm saying. It's so sad. Katie majored in international relations 
with a minor in history, studied Italian, and had a cumulative GPA of 3.84 in this year. Um, in late January of 2022, Katie was selected as just one of the 12 Stanford students for the Mayfield Fellows Program, a prestigious opportunity to students of any major to develop the theoretical understanding, practical knowledge, and leadership skills needed to establish, scale, and lead principled high-growth technology ventures. Katie also earned, in early 2022, a selection as Defense Innovation Scholar, where the selection team was impressed with her passion for national security, demonstrated a record of achievements. I mean, it just goes on and on, like all the good stuff that she's done. Chosen as an early ambassador, uh, completed the initial episode of Be the Mentality. I mean, literally, the month of, man, she starts a podcast. Like, get the fuck out of here. This is so depressing. Navigated the interview process to do a TED Talk, for fuck's sake. In two months, she was going to be on TED Talk. Are you kidding me? Never came to fruition. Because she's gone. In addition to being a model student and athlete at Stanford, Katie thrived in making friendships across the spectrum of students on campus and was widely known and adored by other students, faculty, and staff. Stanford appeared to love Katie as much as she loved the school, as over the years, Stanford repeatedly used Katie's image and likeness to promote its university sports programs and civic pride, including its recruitment of other women in soccer used photos of her to promote the school and Stanford's athletic program. Another example, they used her on the Twitter page. Since Katie's passing, Stanford Athletics has removed her image and likeness from the header because there's no one quite like Katie Stanford Athletics has not been able to find a picture to replace it. She remained an icon. Put everything she had into her endeavors while at Stanford devoted, a devoted student, peer, and athlete. Had a goal of continuing her devotion. And Stanford continued to recognize Katie as model representative of Stanford. Following her death, Stanford honored Katie with the Stanford Athletics Stanley Awards. Really? Cardinal Career Award 2022, which recognizes the athlete who best embodies the ideals of being a Stanford student athlete and pursues excellence on and off the field. That's when they realized they fucked up. That's when they realized they fucked up. They give her an award posthumously because they're like, uh-oh, we need to at least pretend. We can't just leave it. <sighs> um, in June... Katie was also awarded the 2022 Spirit of Stanford Award, an award presented to a charismatic student athlete who excels at his or her sport and is an effective leader. Yada, yada, yada. All bullshit. Stanford made representations to students and families establishing a duty of care and the social, uh, the special, excuse me, relationship the school had with its students. So now they have to tie it in together, at least somewhat at the outset, right? Um, Stanford made many representations to the plaintiffs in its promotional materials, orientation, and admission documents on its website, and in all its communications with Katie and everybody else, that we owe a duty of care to you. 
We have several resources to help guide students and families along the way. Bullshit. Stanford's commitment linked to every aspect of the life on the farm. Bullshit. To all the parents and family members who are here and wish, we're here to wish you well as you embark on this journey. More bullshit. Propaganda. That's what they're saying. Stanford's systematic failures in its OCS and other departments resulted in severe emotional distress, which led to her death. Um, that's a, they're basically tying it all together. Um, let's get to the causes of action. We got the backstory. We got the backstory. Let's get to the good stuff. Insufficient evidence to formally charge Katie and did so in a punitive act of gender discrimination. Um, Stanford was on notice that its OCS process was punitive, violated students' rights, and caused them harm. And tragically, her death was entirely foreseeable and preventable. I'm wondering if they're going to break it up into like causes of action it doesn't look like it employees like i guess they're choosing it to uh stanford's employees individual defendants responsible for the uh ocs program it's it's a typo there process that caused or substantially contributed to cause katie's death there we go. Count one. All right, here we go. Wrongful death. Plaintiff, da, 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 against all defendants. They realize incorporate. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Defendants had a duty to know that your typical Stanford students, especially a student athlete, as well as captain, who is a perfectionist, is associated with pressures. They had to ensure a safe environment on campus for both living and learning from student, Stanford students, including Katie. Defendants had a duty to know that a diploma hold and other penalties in the final semester of one's college would mean, what would that mean to a Stanford student of a high achieving division one Stanford student athlete and threaten her? Like they, they knew this is not a, oops, we couldn't see that coming. They had a reasonable care, training, supervision of its staff. They owed a duty of reasonable care. They failed in it. Actual notice they had. It's overly punitive. Causes inappropriate distress. Defendants had actual notice that the process was draconian and often implemented disproportionate punishment in comparison with the alleged violation. So... The sexual abuser walks away, she spilled coffee, and she can't graduate. The alleged sexual abuser, but still. Defendant had actual notice that she was seeing a sports psychologist for help with focusing and anxiety. Katie gave the sports psychology department express permission to advise her athletic trainer of their visits. Yet her provider never contacted Katie's athletic trainer, leaving out a key individual in her treatment and in violation of NCAA best practices. Defendants had actual notice through its sports psychology department that Katie experienced additional anxiety and depressive symptoms concurrently with the distressing OCS process. They had notice about her recovering from knee surgery and unable to play soccer for the first time in her name at Stanford. Emotional distress as a result of the pandemic, and so on and so forth. And as a result, negligently, defendants carelessly, negligently, recklessly, maliciously, and unlawfully breach their duties by bringing the charges against her and failing to help her in any humane way. The survival action, like I said, that's the plaintiff's. Her mom and dad as successors, 
in interest to Katie. Again, a lot of the language is going to be repeated. Um, and because of that, they owed a duty of care. And as a result, her parents can recover. Breach of implied contract. Um, they, Steve and Gina Meyer accepted the contracts and also fully complied with their payment obligation went above and beyond their obligations with their contributions to Stanford. Stanford breached their express and implied contractual duties by failing to ensure that Katie was provided with a safe environment in which to participate in women's soccer and related activities and by concealing and or failing to warn her of the distress related to the OCS disciplinary process sees and are failing to disclose that Stanford did not adhere to all NCAA PAC 12 and Stanford rules governing intercollegiate athletics. It's so crazy. All of this could have been prevented if only they had an ounce of humanity. And they're saying none of this is true. Not like factually, but we didn't cause this. Breach of contract, Stanford violated its own policies and procedures. Failed to gather exonerating evidence on behalf of Katie. Failed to provide her with due process rights. Presume Katie guilty and not innocent upon charging her. Like, how do you presume someone guilty of a charge? As a result, Katie suffered an acute stress reaction and uncontrollable impulse to end her life, resulting in her tragic and untimely death. Now, what is this California Education Code? Let's find out. Um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, among other things, in any program or activity conducted by any post-secondary educational institution that receives or benefits from state financial aid. Ah, they harassed, bullied, and abused her on the basis of gender is what they're saying. That's the claim that Stanford abused Katie because of her gender and thereby violating that policy. And yeah, I mean, obviously Nick Van Dems, uh, obviously they're going to deny it, but yeah. Um, as described more fully above, Katie suffered harassment that was so severe, pervasive, and offensive that it effectively deprived Katie of the right of equal access to educational benefits and opportunities as she was charged over allegations of spilling coffee on a student and the male football player was not charged for alleged sexual assault of a minor Stanford athlete. Oh, yeah. The gender discrimination Katie faced at Stanford when she was denied equal rights and opportunities and subject to emotional harm throughout the OCS process. Count six, loss of consortium. That's an easy one. They will, they, the parents have suffered and will experience future suffering for the loss of their daughter's love, companionship, comfort, care, assistance, protection, affection, society, and moral support. Count seven, negligent infliction of emotional distress on the parents. When the defendants acted recklessly by sending threatening emails to Katie, causing her death, the parents suffered. 
And then, of course, intentional infliction of emotional distress when they sent the letter causing Katie harm. Prayer for relief. Wherefore, plaintiffs respectfully request judgment against defendants as follows. Injunctive relief, restitution, disgorgement, and or other appropriate relief. Award compensatory, punitive, exemplary, and other recoverable damages. For loss of society, affection, and companionship, funeral expenses, and other losses as allowed under the code for wrongful death. Pain and suffering damages for Katie and punitive damages under the code for the survivor action for damages to which the decedent would have been entitled if she had survived, awarding reasonable attorney's fees and expenses, pre- and post-judgment interest, and awarding such other and further relief as this court may deem just and proper. And of course, jury demanded. Plaintiffs demand a trial by jury on all tribal issues. Submitted three weeks ago. That's the complaint. Obviously, we skipped a lot. Um, like I said, it's a very lengthy one. You saw it was like 400 some odd lines. I wasn't going to go. <laughs> I wasn't going to torture you all through every single one because there's there's no need. You got the gist. We covered the, the main points, the most important ones. Um. But there you have it. That's the complaint. The parents representing Katie's estate are suing Stanford and a bunch of others. I'll know some of you in the comments have asked, is Michelle Dauber involved in this? Oh, yes, she is. A hundred percent. She's at the top of the Jane Doe list. Her name will eventually be unearthed as more discovery allegations come out. Um, there is rumor that Michelle Dauber deleted her Twitter because of this lawsuit. I think it's a combination. It's, uh, I don't want to inject myself into it. I just don't like to take credit for things. Um, but I did, I did do a video on Michelle Dauber. If you haven't seen it, it's literally titled what is wrong with Michelle Dauber. And the fact that when she left Twitter, she was like, I just want to make it clear. It was nothing that these fools have done. And I'm like, just because you have to say that kind of raises eyebrows. Like, are you sure about that? Are you sure it wasn't uh, because of that? I don't know. But Michelle Dauber, who is she? Somebody asked. Oh, God, I do not want to get into that. She's a professor of law at Stanford University. Not for long, but she is currently and she's the most vile anti dep human you will ever have the displeasure of hearing about. She is personal friends with Amber Heard. If that doesn't tell you everything, then I don't know what does. And uh, they shared the stage accepting an award on a, uh, a social justice warrior that they used as a scapegoat who wrote a book saying I wanted nothing to do with it, but I was used. I did not want to bring allegations against that Brock Turner guy or whatever his name was. Um, and there's like all the, this whole story that allegedly it, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time rather than, uh, this actually happening. So it's like, it's a giant clusterfuck. It really is a, a giant cluster of things. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very depressing. It's very saddening. Uh, but I think there's more to the story. And I'm really hoping that, you know, <laughs> th this whole chant, if you all remember by, by uh, who was it? Who was the group that originally said it? No justice, no peace. You remember that? No justice, no peace. Well, it seems like the FBI is about to come down on these people. 
the no ju no justice, no peace, because you can't take away students' rights and then hide behind a veil of, look, I was just pursuing justice. No, this is a no justice, no peace kind of moment because what they were doing is they were setting up these hubs with individuals who had like two to four days of training, two to four days of training, and they were acting in the capacity of a law enforcement agent slash investigator slash judge slash jury slash executioner slash disciplinarian slash more slash more slash more. And they, this one person would decide whether or not you get your rights as a student taken away if they determined by whatever the fuck standard they had that you committed this offense of sexual assault against another student. That's Title IX. That's literally depriving students of their constitutional rights to due process, innocence until proven guilty, and to be having to be proven guilty in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. It's absolutely despicable, disgusting shit. And recently, Congress has moved to expand Title IX. I think they know that it's under fire and it's going to die. So they're like using the last vestiges of their, uh, it almost feels like corporate power, because that's what I want to say. But they're, they're um, what's it called? Um, their congressional power, which I don't want to call it that, because but that's what it is. They're using the last vestiges of their congressional power to try and salvage this Title IX by expanding the definition of what sexual assault means in order to protect more students. Remember what I said in, in a few, few lives ago? They're literally taking a corrupt uh, institution, the Title IX procedure, that is already depriving students of their rights. And now they're going to throw more bodies onto the pile. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. So I'm hoping that this lawsuit can also have a cascade effect on the, the Title IX. Because um, what, what, happens, what happens when you realize your project is about to die a slow death, you try to capture more people in it before it dies. I hate to make a comparison with Hitler, but unfortunately it works here. Did you know that towards the end of the war, when Hitler realized that he was losing, he accelerated his project in exterminating the Jews? He actually funneled as many resources as he, as he possibly could into exterminating the largest number of Jews that he possibly could towards the end of the war. Why? Because he knew he was going to lose. He knew it was only a matter of time. So might as well get rid of as many as we possibly can in the time remaining. That is literally what Congress is doing right now with Title IX. They realize that it's about to die. But we have a few months. Maybe we can widen the scope, capture a few more, get some more money, and then, and then when it dies, it will go. Oopsies! We didn't realize that that's gonna that's gonna do the the effect that we had. So it's like <sighs> the parallels to the parallels to history are just unprecedented. So um, anyway, enough depressing shit for one day, shall we? I I'm I'm tired. I'm exhausted, you guys. Um. This is just so depressing. But hey, I want to thank you for joining me and, um, you know, spending uh, a Thursday evening with me talking about Katie. May she rest in peace, huh? A moment of silence for Katie.
Thank you all for joining me, and I will see you all on Monday. Bye, everybody.